So it looks like, yes, it looks like we're recording. So um, welcome to Reaffilia. This My name is Paul Humphreys, um, doing interviews in freshwater science. And today I've um, got on the other end of the line, um, Dr. Emily O'Gorman from Macquarie University. Thanks for coming and having a, an interview, Emily. It's really nice to have you on, on board. Um, and what I normally do at the beginning of these things is I actually look up your name on the internet, which is always a bit dangerous. Um, and fortunately for you, Emily O'Gorman's a fairly unusual name, so there's not too many um, people with the same name as yours. But I, I do see that um, you dabble in writing books on how to uh, get children to sleep and keeping them asleep. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So well done for, for having a sideline like that. That's good. I like that. <laughs> Quite extensive number of books that you've or at least somebody with your same name as, as you has written. But anyway, um, you're an environmental historian. Yes, is that what yeah. you call yourself? Um, can you just tell us what a, an environmental history person does? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I guess in general terms, environmental historians are interested in um, questions that we might call environmental, but they're often, um, as we look into them more, complicated than that. So social environmental or socio environmental questions historically. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's often described as um, looking at people's changing relationships with environments. Although um, people in the field would um, probably add a bit more complexity to that. So the field's also changed and is changing um, in terms of how it describes itself, I would say, where there's been more and more critiques of the separation between humans and mm. Mm. nature. So um, that sort of description of the field is probably a little outdated and it is changing. But in general terms, we're interested in socio-ecological relationships over time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. And so how did you actually get into environmental history in the first place? What, what makes a, a young student or person um, want to be an environmental historian? Where does that come from? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I guess for me personally, I've always been interested in history. I don't know where that interest came from. I've, just from when I can uh, first remember, I've always been interested in history, always sought out history books. Uh, so when I decided to go to university, I um, started doing a history major straight away. Mm -hmm. I also was doing cultural studies major. Um, and then in probably about my third year, probably my last year of my undergrad, I took an environmental history unit. And mm -hmm. for me, uh, this, this is it. This is at Queen. Was it Queensland? Yeah, University of Queensland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I... Um, took this unit and a lot of light bulbs went off um, because while I had been interested in history, I also had a sort of simmering interest in um, environmental issues and topics. Uh, I actually come from a family of architects. All right. They're very interested in space and place. Uh, uh, and so those sort of questions had always been around me, something I've been interested in, um, how people use places and spaces and interact with them and live in them. So, um, you know, taking this environmental history unit, which was taught by Jeff Ginn at University of Queensland, mm -hmm. just, um, you yeah, know, brought together these interests for me. And, and did you do uh, honour, honours with him? Sorry? Did you do honours with him? Yeah, I did do honours with him. So after that, um, because I was looking for what's next and I just mm -hmm. found this thing that I really love, environmental history, uh, yeah, I talked to him about doing honours and then did that. Um, what was the topic? Long. What was the topic of that? It was on floods, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was on... Uh, I, it actually took a bit of time to work out what, what to focus on. I initially wanted to look at people's changing relationships with the Brisbane River. Okay. And that got me interested in floods. Um, I started to find a lot of information about the 1974 floods, of course, and then mm -hmm. uh, earlier floods in mm -hmm. 1890, 1893, and I actually started doing research on that. Um, but I, as part of that, I actually just got out a map of Queensland, a rainfall map of Queensland, 
And I started to look at the, um, I think it was actually a rainfall map of showing rainfall variability. So I was drawn to sort of the southwest corner of the state, where, which had this really high rainfall variability, according mm -hmm. to this map. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking more at the rivers there, um, which is, uh, of course, now the northern part of the Murray-Darling Basin. Yes, yeah. So I ended up writing my honours thesis about the history of floods there in the colonial period. Right. So oh. Writing the histories of um, yeah colonial settlements and understandings of these rivers that flooded and also dried up completely. So was that part of what um, got you interested in writing that um, book, Flood Country, that you published a few years ago? Which is where I, we first encountered, I first encountered you because I, I got asked to review the book um, and it was, was fascinating sort of stuff. But it, it, it had, um, well, in, in, amongst other areas, included some of that area up there, didn't it? Yeah. So I, um, once I started doing that research, I sort of, uh, as a young, young person who hadn't heard much of the Murray-Darling Basin before, suddenly realised there's this place mm -hmm. called the Murray-Darling Basin, I became really interested in um, the history of other rivers in that river system. Uh, and that's what I decided to do my PhD on. Okay. Uh, so I um, did that at ANU with Tom Griffiths as a supervisor and also Libby Robin yep. Um, yep. supervising Nicholas Brown and Joe Powell. I had this amazing, amazing array of wonderful Supervisor. It sounds like um, the dream team, if you ask me. Yeah, it was a <laughs> I was very lucky. Um, and yeah, so I did my PhD on histories of floods in the wider Murray-Darling, or what we now call the Murray-Darling, um, and produced the book out of that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, in, in it's for my ec more ecological field, we tend to write, you know, lots and lots of papers and things. And but in more in humanities, um, I think there's a tendency sometimes to put your thesis into a book, which I really like. I like that because you know you're producing a thesis anyway, and um, uh, it puts everything together. And it's much more of a narrative and a, and a story, which I which I really appreciate. Um, mm -hmm. We were, um, we were actually encouraged, uh, particularly by people like Tom Griffiths, to mm -hmm. um, write our theses as though they would be a book. So okay. There was an expectation that we would publish our thesis um, or theses. Mm. I think uh, because you're doing this research, um, many of us were funded through government scholarships to do our PhDs, yeah. like myself, and it's sort of a, a sense of um, duty or obligation to make that research available. Yep. But in that humanities tradition of, of writing books, I suppose, which also have the benefit of reaching these wider audiences. So um, Tom sort of mentored us, uh, many of us um, that were doing PhDs at the time in history at ANU. And is there much of a... Um because you know, as I said, this from my my discipline, we tend to write scientific papers from our from our theses, um, and therefore the 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 level that you're pitching the 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 thesis at is a very similar one that you're pitching the um, the papers at. Is it? But it must be quite different from writing a book, though, isn't it? Because you're you're writing a thesis to, to primarily for examiners, um, which are experts in your field, whereas you're writing a book. Potentially, I mean, unless it's a very, very academic book, and your your flood country book, I found very accessible, um, and um, so to the to the layperson, it, it might be quite accessible. So, did you find that a quite a uh, a challenge? Um, yes and no. So, I think that for history theses, it's a slightly different expectation, where uh, histories are often written um, to be quite accessible, mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. when they're even when you're writing for academic historians um, I think part of that is there's an emphasis on empirical research so there are of course theories and concepts embedded within it but they're not always explicit which sometimes makes it a bit more accessible the emphasis is on the empirical uh, contribution yeah okay I did having said that I did rewrite the introduction because my introduction to my thesis was a bit more um, tailored towards sort of examiners where there was uh, more description of the uh, literature and all that sort of stuff um, that you need to um, do for a thesis. And then mm. yeah, I rewrote that for uh, the book. 
And I did some revision of the chapters uh, from the thesis, but not extensive. Okay. Mm-hmm. Look, uh, um, it was, I found it very, fasc- very fascinating, the, the whole book. And, and I mean, I, from an eco- ecological point of view and looking at floods um, and really their, you know, their, their roles in, in, in ecosystems. But it's, it seems like from, from, from your book and from sort of the, the history of people's perceptions and the interactions with floods, I mean, the Gunda guy one's a perfect example, I think. Um, might ask you to, to, to describe a little bit about what happened there, but that um, people, at least uh, Europeans, went settling those areas and not the indigenous people, um, really had a very, a very, um, I don't know, very strange idea about uh, rivers and, and floods and flooding and, and, and a denial in many ways, it seemed like, that of the power and significance of them and an attempt to uh, repeatedly um, build where they knew that, or perhaps they'd hoped that things wouldn't, come, the floods wouldn't come back as frequently as they did, even though they, um, there was pretty good evidence that they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and as I said, Gundagai is quite a good example. Can you just give us a bit of a pricey about what the story of Gundagai and the, the floods were, if you, if you can? If I, if I can uh, remember, I mean, one of the interesting things about the Gundagai floods is how complex they were when you started to look into some of the detail. But in, um, in general terms, um, mm. Gundagai, which is uh, sort of uh, inland New South Wales in, on the Murrumbidgee or in the Murrumbidgee River system, uh, it was, um, it was uh, col- started to be colonised in the early to mid 1800s and uh, the uh, colonists who were there started to experience floods um, pretty early on. Mm, mm. Uh, so there was, there, is, there was a big flood in 1852, which is sort of the, the main one that mm. is remembered historically for various reasons, including that that uh, triggered the, the move of the town to higher. Was that the one that killed almost a third of, or was it half of the population? Some ridiculous number of people, wasn't there? Yeah, it was a really large percentage of the population. And uh, I think to this day remains Australia's sort of one of Australia's deadliest disasters. And I think the deadliest flood um, mm, mm, in terms mm. of lives lost, I think is around from memory 200 or just over 200 people. And people were, um, quite a few people were saved by the, um, the Aboriginal and that, um, people living nearby in canoes and things from memory, is that right? Yeah. Um, so Yari is a Wiradjuri man who is today celebrated as the hero of mm. uh, the 1852 flood in Gundagai, and he rescued quite a number of people. There were a couple of other Wiradjuri people involved that aren't um, as well known, I suppose, and probably that is because the historical records don't um, describe their efforts and involvement as much. Uh, yeah, so Wiradjuri people saved a number of different, a uh, number of peop, uh, colonists who were living on the... On the they, must have, they must have thought the, 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 pe- the settlers there were pretty silly because, I mean, you know, I, I was actually there only a, uh, a few weeks ago and I, I pass through Gundagai quite often. I always actually stop at Gundagai on the way up to Canberra when I'm going there. I, I, I like the town a lot and... Um, if you turn off the freeway at the right spot, you go across the floodplain and you see the old, the old bridge that, that, that is there. And it's, it's a really fascinating part of the countryside. And you just look at it. And if you've got any idea about a, a river, you just would never build anything on that floodplain. It's such an extensive floodplain. So they must have, um, the settlers must have had some insight into, into that from, um, from the indigenous inhabitants, but they clearly ignored any advice? Yeah. yeah, and there had been earlier floods as well. So they, uh, Wiradjuri people did warn um, the European settlers about floods and being on the floodplain. And then there were a couple of um, smaller floods, one pretty big though in 1844. Um, so the settlers had first hand experience of the floods as well. Um, and there's this fantastic. Um, quote by by one of them um can't remember exactly uh what they say but to paraphrase they 
their eyes were drawn to the debris in the 1884 flood that was lodged there by the flood water. And then they realized there was debris even higher. Mm -hmm. And so they realized that there had been even bigger floods there. Um, but I think, so part of what I looked at in that um, research was why did the European settlers keep um, living on the floodplain mm -hmm. despite knowledge of floods and despite experience of them? And, and why did they? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> what I argue is that they were drawn there because the economic value of being on the flat. So just as you stop there on your travels, uh, colonial travellers stopped at Gundagai. It was a stopping place and a crossing place um, over the mm, river. Mm, mm. So being close to the river, being close to where you needed to cross was important economically. Uh, and that's where the road was. So they were drawn there by the road and the economic value of being on the flat. Uh, and by the time people started to argue to, for uh, the town to be moved, which was actually before the 1852 flood, um, people had invested in those properties mm, mm, mm. and they wanted some sort of land exchange rather than to have to finance the relocation themselves. Um, so it was a, num a number of years before the 1852 flood. So between the 1844 flood and the 1852 flood, there was a lot of tension um, within the town and between the town's people and the uh, colonial government about the location of the town. So it's sort of a, an ongoing issue, um, but it, it seems, and I argue that people were drawn there because of the economic value. And look, that makes sense. I mean, I, I remember watching some documentary some years ago about, I think it was in California and it was, you know, development in probably San, um, San Francisco or something, or where, where I'm trying to think of where the, where the earthquakes are most likely to hit. And um, there are some, parts along um, places along or towns along the or cities along the fault there that they say they just shouldn't be, be built but I gather that you know the, the time between the, the quakes um, makes it economically viable to 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 with the risk there to to take the risk that there will be a lot of damage and maybe loss of life but it, in in between those times it's it's worthwhile but I suppose with the flood side of things is that does that perhaps the the back in the 1840s and 50s is that the, the people's um the people's uh what's the word behavior and and decision making um did that rely to a degree on on their knowledge of the sort of return times of floods and things because that you know knowing what we do know and, and now and having a long period of time when we've been measuring volumes of water uh, in rivers, we, we get a pretty good idea, although you know, not, not entirely um, perfect, we have a pretty good idea about how often we should expect the flood to come through every, you know, for every 10 years or 15, 20 years or something. But in those days, the records would have been pretty poor, I would have thought. Hmm. Um, I mean, Gundagai is an interesting case, again, because it did experience a number of smaller floods and then a big one in 1844 before the, the really big one in mm. 1852. And people um, living on the flat did hypothesize uh, about how frequently they might occur and so on. But I think um, similarly as we do today, there's um, a ten there was a tendency to think that the big one was behind them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think the uncertainty about knowledge was definitely at play. Um, you know, colonists were coming into places they uh, didn't know historically mm -hmm. very well. They, they were trying to form a sense of the place and that sort of uncertainty was definitely at play. Um, and I think there was a evaluation of the risk. Well, you know, maybe it won't uh, happen again and so on. But I think at the same time, um, we continue to, to do that. I was going to ask you do, do you, do you think we're still, we're still in that sort of denial? Yeah, hmm. <laughs> I think we are. And I mean, in some ways we're drawn, I think uh, that uncertainty about knowledge and the histories of living in a place um, within uh, the colonial knowledge frameworks that we've continued to sort of live in and develop and uh, 
so it has been an issue in Australia. Um, and uh, but at the same time, I think we keep thinking, well, the big ones behind us. All the, I mean, part of living in Australia is that averages don't um, no. play a, a big part in. Um, I don't know whether you've read um, Taleb Nassim Taleb, who's written about um, black swans, uh, the black swan events, you know, where these um, big, uh, big events occur, which, which are people think at the time, you know, un they're unpredictable, but then after the fact, they, they rationalize them that they, um, they're always going to happen, but they have some bigger effect on the environment and, or big effect on something. He's more of a, I think he's a stockbroker type person. I've read his, his books and um, it's, it's all, it's a truism really that, that we can only use the past in some ways to, pre to predict the future. But um, our idea about what the maximum extent that something can happen is, is by definition false really, yeah. because <laughs> we can only, we, um, we base, um, we base, you know, the, the, the strength of a dam and a one in 1000 year flood, and then we get a one in 2000 year flood or something. And, yeah. and therefore it's almost certainly going to be something that's going to be bigger that comes along. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, climate change um, sort of exacerbates that uncertainty in a way. But what I find amazing within this current era of climate change is that we know floods are going to get more severe. We know droughts are going to get more severe. And still, you know, there's, this, there's a prevailing attitude, political and more widely, um, to some extent, that the big ones are behind us. Or I, we don't have to deal with that right now because we've just gotten through it like you look at the, mm, the mm. drought we've just had and now we've got um some rains and some floods in some places and so that that political pressure is off to do water reform in places like the murray do you, Basin. But but do you think do you think do you think though i mean i often think that that's actually bigger than that's a bigger thing than politicians or whatever it's 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 a human condition is to sort of you know, it's our, perhaps our lizard brain where we, we get, um, you know, excited, stimulated by something that's there immediate that's affecting us. And then when, when, that, when something else comes along, um, you know, we, or, or the rains come, we forget about that and move on to the next thing. I mean, I, I, I tend to think that the community and human um, psyche sort of uh, contributes to that. I, I know that in the in the current situation we're going through the COVID nineteen, as my um, my concerns about climate uh, are diminished now because I'm you know thinking yeah. about just the fact that I can't go across the border to Wodonga to go shopping, or I can't go and see my kids down in Melbourne, or my father or my brother, and that's more important to me at the moment. You know, shoot me if that's the case, but it's true. And um, you know when that gets resolved, hopefully then, then I can start thinking about other issues again. So yeah. I do wonder that, and it's, I also think that um, this is just a hypothesis that, that um, you know, humans have this arrogance and we've, I mean, in some ways it's, a, it's the beauty of, of humanity that we think we can control the world um, in many ways. And, and when something like a big flood comes on, I think that, that and a, and a, or a big bushfire or something, we get quite shocked out of our complacency that we really have no control over these large climatic events. Mm. Um, and so I, I don't know what you think about sort of that bigger scale psychology of, of humans, but um, yeah, it, it, it seems like that we, um, we hope for the best, often don't expect the worst because the, the worst, as you say, has been behind us, but then the worst comes along and we get surprised by it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the um, sort of reactive, um, the reactive aspects of being in crisis are very powerful. Um, so I think uh, there is a tendency to move from crisis to crisis in terms of um, response and priorities and so on. Um, but as other people have shown, looking at issues like drought, which can be very slow, um, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of slow catastrophes, mm -hmm. shows that these uh, sort of issues sometimes don't get as much attention because they're so um, they're so incremental in their effects and so on. But I think part of the value of history is that 
it helped us to understand the value of taking a longer term perspective that we can um, think beyond uh, crises. Uh, and do you think? Do you think? And, and I, I I agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, it's one reason why I sort of got into. Um, sort of historical ecology, environmental history a little bit myself is because I, I just think you can't understand where you are now unless you understood where you, what, what took to get you to that point. But do you think, um, do you think that really we don't, you know, the community, politicians, um, managers, environmental managers and stuff, we don't value history enough um, in that regard? Um, I think history could always be valued more. <laughs> well, not always, I think currently could be valued more in a whole lot of ways. Um, I think there are managers uh, and politicians out there that do value history. I think though that um, it's probably not used enough. I see, I mean, I don't also don't wanna take the blame off constituents either. So mm. constituents need to put pressure on politicians to act in, ways that they see as in their interests and the interests of um, their environments and so on. So I do think politicians and managers need to value history more, of course. Um, but I also think there is a responsibility for all of us as constituents to also value histories um, and to put pressure on politicians and managers uh, to act in ways that um, take those histories seriously. Look, I, I think I think we're all guilty to a degree of 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 not appreciating history. I mean, I read a, a critique of of sort of contemporary scientists, and and I was one of those too for a long time, until I had my sort of epiphany about historical side of things. And it, contemporary ecologists uh, um, often have a very dim view of history. I think they think of just telling stories. But uh, I read a lovely review. Um, and critique a few years ago of somebody who was saying that basically all scientists are historians, they just don't realise it. And that's because every every study that you've ever done, you, you write up is based on work you did in the past. And that every, um, and some of the most important um, pieces of work that scientists, that ecologists, for example, do are reviews. And reviews are innately historical. You know, you're reviewing what's been done in your field up to the present day you're you're assessing and critiquing the quality of that work in a direction and then you're actually suggesting where that should go mm. and um so you know i it's it's a it's silly to, to to criticize or to say that historians aren't doing important work because because all scientists are by definition historians we just don't recognize it and sometimes like you know it's in the recent past but nevertheless mm. um it's 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 important stuff i think the other thing too i've i've found um, and discussing this with a PhD student of mine just the other day is that um, with sort of contemporary science, the sort of stuff that I would routinely do, is, is we're obsessed with precisionism. So we're, 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 we, we know that at this point in time, at this location, that we can tell you that there are, you know, 10 Murray Cod there because we've sampled them and pulled them out, we've measured their lengths and whatever. Whereas, whereas a lot of historical um, information is is relatively vague, quite often vague, vague in, in time, maybe vague in space and even vague in what was actually there. But so it generalizes, there's more general stuff coming out of that. And um, contemporary ecologists who are very obs obsessed, especially with new technologies, with the precision of measuring the, you know, the length of a hair on the, the end of a, of a, I don't know, a plankton, arm or something then you know it's 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 not particularly satisfy them for, for not to be able to say exactly when where and how something was happening in the past mm -hmm. there's input but these generalizations are really important especially when you come to things like you know floods or locations of perhaps where you should build towns or or what have you that 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 sort of information can be absolutely vital mm -hmm. yeah interesting stuff yeah i think i think the other important i think what you're saying is is right and I um, think one of the values of history that gets uh, somewhat overlooked is the contextual nature of it uh, and people think often um, that context is background whereas actually it's widely 
important mm, um, mm, mm. in terms of understanding the interrelationships between politics, um, social uh, responses and um, well-being, environmental uh, factors and so on, and that they, these are important interplays and we need to think about the relationships that are happening between them. Yeah, look, I was, um, which brings me to some, um, actually to some questions about your book you've just submitted um, for publication due out next year, uh, Wetlands and the Dry Land, which I'm very interested to, and I love, I'm looking forward to reading a lot. And there's some, um, I gather there's, there's quite a lot of that sort of similar material that you just taught referring to in that book. Is that what, tell, can you tell us a little bit about what that book is or what this book's about? Yeah, sure. It um, focuses on the way wetlands have been shaped uh, by people, but also with and against other critters, animals, um, but also plants as well. So it looks at uh, people's changing values of different animals and plants, but also the role of animals and plants in um, interacting with the, um, the sort of frameworks that get established around those those values people have um, and sort of reacting back and shaping reshaping them in various ways so yeah it looks at wetlands historically in the murray darling basin uh, and it focuses on a number of key wetland sites um, it's organized thematically uh, so as to look at the uh, interplay between historical uh, circumstances and contemporary issues. Um, yeah. So, so can you give us an example of, um, I think you've got um, the example of malaria and its and relationship with wetlands and people. How does that all fit together? Yeah, well, um, mosquitoes pop up actually in a couple of chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of, one of the chapters looks at uh, the Toowoomba swamps. So the now city of Toowoomba uh, is built along swamplands right. and these swamps were drained over a period of time from the early 1800s right through to the mid 1900s drained incrementally and in different ways and for different reasons so look at the way the swamps um, uh, acted back or were re recalcitrant in these efforts to drain and get rid of them uh, why were they? Why were they settling around swamps in the first place? I mean, what? Because there would have been mosquitoes there to begin with, and it would have been a horrible place to live, surely. Well, I think this is. I think what you're saying goes to the heart of, <laughs> <laughs> of the way swamps have been valued within um, Western cultures. That they're seen as these uh, these dank, miasmatic um, lands that are full of disease. Um, what do you mean by miasmatic? Give us a definition of that. So as I look at with uh, Toowoomba, uh, there was an understanding in the early 1800s, widespread understanding by medical professionals and more widely, mm -hmm. that swamps caused disease through miasma, which was um, basically inhaling bad air. It was, a miasma was associated with odour and so on. Um, so for example, the idea was that by inhaling um, uh, bad air, mm. that you could get uh, malaria, typhoid, diphtheria, and a range of other diseases. So they didn't know they, that they were insect born or whatever it was in those days. They just, like, they didn't know what, where that, that, that malaria was sourced at that stage. It was just from the, the air. Yeah. So within the, the then current um, medical knowledge, it was that you were getting um, malaria through inhaling bad mm. air. And so swamps were a key source of this bad air um, within that sort of knowledge framework. So, yeah, I mean, the story of Toowoomba is really interesting in that sense because um, while, while swamps were seen um, by many colonists at the time as um, being the source of disease and um, disliked for a range of other reasons, uh, they were important for water supply. Mm -hmm. So... Actually, the colonial settlement um, in that area started somewhere else um, at a place known as the Springs, uh, which is Drayton. But there were issues with that water supply and um, some people had started living at what was then known just as the swamps, which are Toowoomba swamps. And um, 
the stories about who was living there and why are really interesting, but I won't, won't go into that. Um, some people were living there because the, the reeds were used as thatching um, mm -hmm. houses and so mm -hmm. people involved in that sort of industry were living there. Um, uh, Ex-convicts were living there. It was sort of out of, out of sight of authorities and so on. Not many people were, um, or colonists were going there. Uh, Aboriginal people were using the swamps, um, Gearbold people. Um, uh, to tell a really long story short, those living at the settlement of Drayton, the colonists there, became interested in um, the Toowoomba swamps as a source of water supply, which mm -hmm. is why they moved there. But there was this, uh, or the, set, the land releases started to happen, the colonial government ended up supporting that move, um, and the um, at the settlement at Toowoomba grew. There was still a settlement at Drayton, I should say, but it was soon eclipsed mm. by the growing settlement at Toowoomba. Um, again, it was on a good road, <laughs> so there was an economic reason as well. Um, but soon after, the, the colonists at the Toowoomba Swamp started having issues with the swamp lands there, including concerns about diseases and that the swamp was expanding because it, uh, they were using it as a sort of town common. So. Um, cattle were grazing in the swamp and the, their hooves were um, causing erosion and so on and it's, the swamp started growing. The swamp was biting back like you said. <laughs> was biting back, that's right. Um, yeah, but there was a lot of concern over disease. There were a lot of issues um, and epidemics of typhoid and diphtheria in the town mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a rationale um, for the council um, to drain the swamp. Uh, so were they just dumping their sewerage into the, into the water there or something as well? That, that may have been happening. But what, <laughs> so the next part of the story. Yeah, yeah, go on. Was um, that these uh, outbreaks kept happening, even though some efforts were made to drain the swamps. And um, there was a new theory coming up in the medical circles, um, which was germ theory. Mm -hmm. um, and my theories of miasma and germ theory sort of overlap in this really interesting way where they're both held together for a period of time. But this interest in germ theory meant that um, medical people in the town started to pay more attention to where sewage was going. Mm -hmm. um, and so the main uh, uh, sort of place where sewage was was in the cesspits, um, which were out the back of houses and there were a lot along the swamp uh, and there were aquifers underneath. Right. So um, the swamp was being used for water supply, um, which was interacting with the aquifers, which were in turn interacting with the cesspits. Mm, um, great combination there. Yeah. <laughs> and there was this big investigation into the cesspits, which, <laughs> which is pretty gross, but also very interesting um, that they weren't uh, and the investigation found they weren't being maintained um, very well. The sewage was left there for a really long time, um, which was against the sort of then regulation uh, and I understand created more issues in terms of how it interacted with the water supply and so on. But at the same time, in that same investigation, they looked at um, the... the miasmatic qualities of the swamp again as well. So that these um, connections with germ theory and miasmatic theory were, were happening. It's a really interesting investigation for that, for that reason. Um, and yeah. there's a line in, in one of the, I think by one of the commissioners that says something like, between the, the air we breathe and the water we drink, we don't sort of stand a chance against these diseases. So they're encapsulating those two theories in that just one statement. It seems, uh, yeah, uh, look, it's interesting. Um, it brings up a number of things in, in my head, like, um, you know, the sort of uh, people's interest and in, I suppose fear, but also um, reliance on, on water and swamps and, and wetlands and rivers and, and, and everything. You know, there's a lot of, lot of sort of creation myths associated with water and thinking about, you know, the creatures from the Black Lagoon and uh, I think it's uh, some of the harpies and stuff in northern um, UK and things associated with, with water that, that I suppose the risk there that, you know, that you'd go out at night and you'd never return because you got sucked into the water but uh, or, or taken away by some strange 
being that was going to do some unspeakable things to you, but also, you know, had this sort of life giving properties, but also mm -hmm. that, yeah, that, that idea about the air, like, um, you know, prior to knowing uh, how scurvy came about and, you know, the, the ships coming out from Europe to um, far flung places like Australia, um, trying to, I think they were putting smoke and various things through the holds to try to get rid of that bad air, bad air mm. which of course was a complete waste of time. But I was going to ask you with the, um, the Toowoomba example, I mean, was that sort of replicated around Australia in terms of settlements um, to do with, with water like swamps and wetlands? Yeah, in terms of draining them. Well, in terms of in terms of people wanting to be near them for their water supply, but then having to drain them, because I, I think that's a fascinating area. Is that, I mean, I think that that's also replicated around the world with with rivers and this, um, and getting back to the Gundagai thing. I've often thought that we 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 colonise, settle around water bodies for the obvious reasons of water supply, but also supplies of things like fish, and then uh, we're there and we farm the land next next nearby because it's so fertile because of floods. And so we're there for the very reason that, that, these, that these systems are operating um, the way they do. And then after a while, uh, they start to cause us major problems and, and we have to start controlling them by draining them or, or in the case of rivers, trying to keep them in channels. Um, and that seems to me sort of totally contradictory, but so sorry, I interrupted you. So this, this is a fairly common example um, situation. Yeah, I, I certainly think drying out the the land or landscape, making, um, you know, wetland areas more terrestrial, um, or what we would say now more terrestrial, um, would, it was very common, um, and draining wetlands for reasons of disease, um, including miasma, has been very common. Um, what I found really interesting is that when the connection between um, mosquitoes and malaria gathers uh, scientific evidence and momentum um, in the late 1800s and then into the early 1900s. Um, there's sort of a renewed effort to drain wetlands mm. because of the role as mosquito breeding grounds. So that, um, that link between malaria and mosquitoes sort of cements um, and renews interest in draining wetlands. Um, that was probably an unfortunate metaphor with the cement, but <laughs> that <laughs> oh, that's, that's what good. ends up happening in Toowoomba is that the, the swamps become concrete, concrete, concrete. Oh, really? But malaria, I mean, malaria doesn't get down that far south anyway, does it anyway? No, so I should say that while the link between um, mosquitoes and malaria was probably of most interest to um, scientists at the, at the end of the 1800s and into the early 1900s, um, a range of other diseases become um, mm. linked with mosquitoes as well. And while this research is taking place, there um, is sort of a widespread concern amongst governments uh, in many places around the world that any mosquito could be um, bringing disease. Sure, um, yeah. Because more and more diseases are getting linked with mosquitoes and um, who knows, these mosquitoes might be... Um, carrying diseases or spreading diseases as well. So um, there wasn't so much concern about malaria in Toowoomba, although there were investigations um, and they did find Anopheles mosquitoes there, which are well-known, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. now well-known carriers of um, malaria. And they did look into it. I think there might've been a case there as well, but what complicates the story and why there might've been a case there is that in the um, First and Second World Wars, returned soldiers um, start um, coming back from where they've been fighting uh, and some of them have co contracted malaria. Uh, okay. And other mosquito-borne diseases, but of most interest to the Australian government was uh, malaria carriers coming back. And then there was a fear by the government that um, the local mosquitoes would then um, become vectors so the life cycle is that the mosquito has to sucks the blood from a, a person with malaria and then transfers it to another person. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I sh sorry, I should say, yep. so there was a um, fear, there were outbreaks of dengue mm -hmm. in um, Queensland and other places around Australia um, in this 
in the first half of the 1900s. And so uh, the interest in mosquitoes around um, Toowoomba is around dengue, around carrier, carry, carry, being carriers of um, parasitic worms and so on. So mm -hmm. this, uh, this sort of the early 1900s, there's this interest in mosquitoes as um, vectors of disease, carriers of disease, um, so on not just malaria, but for all sorts of different diseases. So they become like public enemy. So people, so people really would have had a fairly negative view of, of swamps and, and wetlands and, and sort of water, sort of natural water more generally. And that, yeah, that wouldn't, I can imagine that wouldn't um, augur well for the, the maintenance of those places. I was going to um, sort of segue into, because I'm thinking, I'm just thinking about, that sounds, you know, investigating the history of that sounds fair, relatively benign. You, you can probably contradict me, but but you also included the Kurong um, in your book, mm -hmm. and the 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 lower lakes, the um, lakes Alexandrina and Albert, and the the, um, the Kurong. That that's sort of quite controversial uh, area for all sorts of reasons. I know because of. Um, um, you know the, the the millennium drought in the in the in the Murray. The debates about whether the about barrages and about fresh versus salt water, and also about the lakes with um, changing agriculture, draining water into those um, uh, lakes as well, changing the nature of the uh, of the of the Kurong. So, do, do environmental historians like yourself get into trouble, um, sort of <laughs> investigating and? And researching those things because that's that's been a fairly hot topic of of the last decade or so. Um, I, certainly, we can annoy people. <laughs> <laughs> How do you annoy people by by actually finding facts and telling people what things were really like in the past? Is that right? Yeah. Well, I, th I mean, people have a stake in these stories and stake in these histories and how they're told. So, um, yeah, I think it's important for us as historians to be mindful of that and to make sure we um, we consider um, a whole range of stories and factors in how we go about writing our histories. Um, I found being in the Kurong and talking to people living there um, a really eye-opening experience and people were very uh, generous with spending time with me and telling me um, their stories. Uh, yeah, so the Kurong comes up a few times in in the book. Um, I it comes up um, in a chapter that uh, engages with Aboriginal women's weaving practices, um, and it comes up in a chapter about uh, the mass slaughter of pelicans, um, which was seen as as pests by fishes um, in the Kurong region and a range of other places. Uh, in the early 1900s. And it also comes up in the final chapter, which is about, um, uh, it's about uh, the resurgence of long-nosed uh, fur seal populations in the area um, that are understood by scientists to be rebounding from sealing. And they're currently causing issues for the seals, causing issues for fishes in the region um, through damaging nets and so on. But the broader, um, changes on the Kurong, uh, additional pressures for fishes um, with the building uh, of the barrages, uh, blocking um, basically the um, River Murray from, from its mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that has caused a lot of pressures and changes in the um, ecology of the region and um, cascading issues, including on people's livelihoods. Um, yeah. One, one of the things that, I mean, one of the reasons why, again, why I got really interested in sort of um, getting into the historical side of things was this concept of um, shifting baseline syndromes, you know, where, where people's stories, which are all, you know, legitimate, but often only extend back as far as either their career, if they're a scientist or, or perhaps to their childhood um, for other reasons, maybe as farmers or whatever, and, and may, may might extend a bit further back to their parents or even their grandparents. But, but if things have been changing well, things always change by definition, and and if things have become big, changing uh, more rapidly with with you know since the industrial revolution and since um, settlement, then then um, people people describing what 
what existed back when they were when the children is it's just one one spot in the trajectory of change so i think i, I find at least very useful to be able to um to be able to go back further in time apart from showing those sort of fluctuations and, and trajectories of change is to is to um you know say to people well no sorry redfin european perch uh, are not native they they were introduced you might like catching them but they were actually were introduced to this country in the 18, 1857 i think it was and they're not actually a native species so perhaps we shouldn't be um uh, encouraging um their proliferation not that people really do yeah. so do you find that um do you find that uh um when you talk to people they have this memory or they have these experiences but are they receptive to the fact that you know that obviously there's a lot of stuff that happened prior to them i can imagine indigenous people certainly do because of um of the, the stories long but but in terms of um the the other people there do they, are they receptive to those sort of descriptions of what the place was like 100 150 whatever thousands of years before they were there mm. Uh, yeah, I think um, the pe at least the people I have spoken to have been um, really interested um, in. I mean, they they often know much more than me about uh, what it, what has happened in the places that they're living in, um, and I've actually been really um, amazed at how willing they are to um, listen to what I have to say, I suppose, as an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, and that they're, they're, yeah, they're happy to be um, uh, challenged, I suppose, in some of their understandings. But I think it also, when you're living in a place and uh, there's more information about that place and, and uh, history of that place that you... Um, well, I guess you can see your your um, relationship with that place and your story in that place within a longer uh, history. I think there's a there's a, in some ways a, a validation and a point of reflection um, that that can happen through knowing that that history as well and putting your yeah. Look, I, yeah, I, I sounded a bit arrogant. I think saying that you come along and tell people what their place was like before they were there, and they've been living there for several generations in some cases, and many, many generations in other cases. That's that's true, and one has to be a little bit humble, not a little bit, a lot humble about coming to to these places and having some um, credibility at all as being a, a scientist or a historian, telling people what they should know. No, I look, I I definitely agree with that. Um, uh, I think um, my experience at least is people certainly do value that sort of um, appreciation of, of where things came from that, that you might be able to provide that they haven't looked at. Uh, go on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, I think people are also um, generally pretty happy that someone's interested in what's happening in yeah. their place and what's happened in their place, which is certainly something I, I found because it's a place that they know and value and they... Of course, other people should know and value this place. Do you know what I mean? So they're they're really, um, uh, uh, in general, really happy to talk to you about their place and um, hear about what you found, um, tell you about what they know, and so on. That's it. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, I recently had a visit from uh, an artist and, uh, and her husband um, from uh, from from near Sydney, and. Um, uh, she's an artist who has a lot of interest in the environment and in water, amongst other things. And we went for a bit of a wander down the river. She wanted to look at some areas of river that were uh, of the Murray, which were degraded. I'll put it in inverted commas, you know, degraded. Um, and it was interesting when she asked me to, to you know, to show her some of the river. Um, and and I sort of, it was a bit more, I said, it's a lot more complicated than that. And I took her down to a part of the river um, probably you know, 100 k south of, of Albury. And we went to this beautiful area and it's just uh, the river's lined with red gums, really lovely old red gums. And there's banks and, you know, fish jumping in the water and pelicans and all sorts of wonderful things. And, and we're looking at it and it looks like a paradise, but it's, it's such an altered system from, you know, 
since river regulation and the river was flying high and fast and strong and this is in the sort of um, the middle of summer when it would normally be a trickle or it would still be flowing but it would be a trickle compared to what it was and it's 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 such a complicated situation where you're you're looking at something and as an ecologist i know that this river should be quite different than it is in many ways but it, it looks wonderful and so trying to um explain to somebody who's perhaps not a scientist that um that this this is a uh, a lovely place to be but the the whole the whole cycle of the the flow is reversed and therefore it's cha changed the 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 suite of species that can exist there and and what they can do um it, yeah it, it i struggled with that and i struggle with that like when i go down to um to the locks you know to the locks down in the lower part of the river and and they're wonderful places to boat around and go fishing and things but you know they're they're in many ways they're a travesty of um what we've done to the to have made a whole series of long lakes to what would normally be a flying river uh, i i struggle with that sort of thing all the time not sure what how how to perceive these sort of things and, I, and i'm a, supposedly a river scientist <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it goes back to that question of baselines as well that you were saying about um, given uh, given all the changes along the river, um, all the responses of all the different species in a sort of dynamic way, um, should, I guess the question is, should um, we be managing these environments to some other some other state um, that they were at another point in time. Um, I think it's a really tricky question. Um, I guess uh, what I, um, my view on it in which I discuss in the last chapter, which is about the long nose fur seals in the Kurong, um, is that the past should be a guide, but not a goal. We, there's no way <laughs> we, can, um, we can go back to uh, mm. some point in time because it's sort of a, a misunderstanding of of, um, of ecologies in some ways and uh, as static um, and misunderstanding of their histories um, as static uh, prior to that date as well. Yeah. Um, certainly history should not be ignored uh, and we need to, to use it as a guide but not a goal. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's a very nice way of putting it. Um, it's it's often something that I, I sort of get people criticising too, is, you know, what's the point of knowing um, what happened in the past because we can never return to it. And I, one of the things I used to say is, but it, does, it also gives us an idea about the potential of these places, um, that what it might, you know, not we won't be exactly the same, but what, you know, if at one stage the river supported this many tons of, of fish flesh, for example, you know, the potential is that we could have something like that if mm. we replace all the carp with Murray cod, for example. Um, but it's also, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really good point. It gives us a sort of a guide to, to what's happened and, and, and perhaps gives us some inkling insight into how we might um, improve things in the future. Oh, look, I've got to ask you, um, we haven't got, we've been going for almost an hour, I think, and I still haven't got to ask you about brine shrimp and deep thyme. And I've got to do that because I've, I've seen a, uh, a chapter, it looks like in a book. And, and actually the, the title of the book is called um, Living, Living with the Anthropocene. Right, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so I think the title I gave you was incorrect. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, but it says an encounter with brine shrimp and deep thyme. Yeah. How do you, what's, what is the relationship between brine shrimp? I mean, I, look, I remember brine shrimp when I was a kid and this is probably showing my age a bit. I used to buy magazines, um, not magazines, cartoons. Um, I can't remember what cartoons they were. They're probably Archie and Jughead comics from back in the 60s and early 70s and on the back page on the back they had um sea monkeys you could buy sea monkey um eggs and you could create have you seen these have you seen these things and you and you hatch them out and you have this family of you know there's the mum and the dad and the kids who look like real sort of humans or aliens with funny things on there and they were just brine shrimp but artemia i never actually bought the eggs but i got intrigued by the fact that you could have these families of of um 
of sea monkeys, as they call them. So, Brian Shrimp for Deep Time, what's that all about? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it is, so the, the chapter is really a, a, um, a reflection on a trip I took down to the Kurong, where I met a, a woman um, who lives right along the edge of the Kurong. And we went walking out along these uh, beautiful sort of sandy flats that, that taper into the um, long, thin uh, lagoon of the Kurong. And um, I'm walking along and I slipped on the sand um, and underneath it was black. And she said, oh, that's the brine shrimp. And I said, what, what do you mean? The black stuff is the... And she said, yeah, that's the brine shrimp. And um, what had happened is that the conditions in the Kurong during the millennium drought had become so uh, dry that, um, and salty. That's, and uh, mm -hmm. the conditions had become perfect for these brine shrimp that were dormant to hatch. Um, and it attracted birds from sort of around the continent that normally uh, go to places like Lake Eyre, like Arid, <laughs> mm, Arid Lakes. Mm. Um, and uh, then they all died and their bodies formed this, this layer. Right. So the, um, I hope I'm getting this story right. So please refer to the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Gives, gives people a good, in, good incentive to read the chapter. <laughs> incentive to read the chapter. But basically, the conditions in the Kurong um, during the drought um, mm. became such that the brine shrimp, the brine shrimp hatched, and um, then they all died, and they mm. formed this, this layer um, that uh, just is sort of sitting underneath this thin layer of sand. And um, so the chapter's a reflection on how this, um, how this draws us into a consideration of these long, um, long droughts um, and a consideration of climate change, but also the histories of droughts in Australia. Um, the brine shrimp were there, they were just waiting for the right conditions that um, were fostered partly by climate change. Um, so, about how the brine shrimp draw us into this longer history of droughts and floods in Australia, um, of the ecology of the continent, um, but also make us consider who are going to be winners and losers in the Anthropocene. Okay. Um, oh, right. No, well, okay. I, I, I take my hat off to you and the brine shrimp because that sounds like um, a lot more um, depth to that than than these cartoon comics that I used to write. <laughs> um, now that, that is, it is interesting. I, I've, um, I've had several students actually who've, who've looked at uh, hatching out um, in, in wetlands. These are completely freshwater wetlands. Um, the, um, the eggs from various plankton um, that live in, in wetlands and dries out and billabongs and they, they flood and they hatch out again. And it's an incredibly productive systems that we have where these yeah. have this ability to go into diapause, um, suspended mm. animation or something essentially for sometimes decades. Mm. Um, fascinating that, you know, that, that can happen. I, I'm, I'm also amazed how the birds, how do the birds work that out? You know, how do they, how do they get to Lake Eyre and know that it's got water in it and there's food for them? And then how do they come down to the Coorong and know it's there? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to find somebody who can who can tell me how that all works. Because that that uh, it's just amazing to me how that works. Um, so this this book um, uh, that you're coming out next year, Wetlands yeah. in a in a Dry Land. It sounds fascinating. Um, who's who's the publisher of that? Uh, University of Washington Press. Okay, University of Washington Press. Great. I look really look forward to it. And, and when next year? Any idea when it might be coming out? Uh, April. 2021. Okay, great. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Say that the, the, the context of the book is um, that there's been a huge loss, loss in wetlands around the world. Um, so from since 1800, 80% of the world's wetlands have been lost. Um, and I think 50% of those since 1900. Wow. So uh, it, it looks at the way Australia is sort of both mirrored or, or the Murray Darling Basin more specifically has mirrored and contributed to these um, changes, these losses of wetlands. Um, but again, as I said, uh, the way that 
that that has sort of happened with and against other species or the changes in wetlands have happened with and against other species. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, that sounds fascinating. And it's, um, I'm sure people will be very interested in that. Well, look, I think we might, and we might wrap it up. I mean, we could talk for a lot more, lot longer about um, all the work that you do, but I, I certainly have a great um, um, respect for environmental historians um, like yourself, in, in especially ones doing with water, which is my my love too, uh, and how it, it gives us a much richer, deeper understanding of of um, our past, which, as you say, guides us sort of into the future. At least I hope it does, and um, to encourage more people to to read and and understand more about the history, so that we don't make the same mistakes again. And I think that we started off to talk about um, you know flood. Um, occurrences of flood and recurrences of floods and things like that and understanding the nature of of the systems that we're we're living amongst um and if we if we don't we're we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes we've made in the past so um keep up with the good work i think it's <laughs> wonderful stuff and look forward to reading that book um any other major projects coming up that you're involved with that before we finish um <laughs> A couple that I'm working on. I mean, part of what has um, happened through doing this book is that I've started some collaborations um, as I've spoken to people um, living and working and interested in other parts of the basin. So one of the people um, who I've started a collaboration with is Danielle Carney Flakler, who's a Wellwyn woman whose country includes the Macquarie Marshes. And we've started a project that is rereading historical sources, including colonial, but also early um, 20th century sources for well and women's knowledge, which is something that she initiated and I was very happy um, to, to be involved in. Mm. So we're working on that together. Oh, that sounds great. Look forward to hearing more about that too sometime. All right. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, we'll, um, I'm sure we'll talk in the future and I look forward to as I said, to, to seeing your book come out and I'll definitely get a copy and maybe even try to review it. Who knows? All right. Yeah, that'd be good. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Emily. <laughs>